so our first uh, speakers today um, for a presentation called What to Expect When You're Expecting GIS to Support NG911. Um, we have Annie Cahill and Sandy Dyer from Datamark. Annie Cahill is a GIS technician manager with Datamark on the public safety team of Michael Baker International and has 15 years of local government experience. Ms. Cahill is a GISP, is on the board of directors with the Geospatial Information Technology Association, GITA, and is actively involved in NINA work groups. Sandy Dyer is a public safety expert with Datamark on the public safety team of Michael Baker International has, and has been in public safety for over 20 years in various roles from 911 dispatch, master street address guide uh, coordinator, uh, 911 system administrator and 911 project manager with the state of Arizona 911 progress program office with a focus on PSAP operations, wireless services, GIS, and next gen 911. Ms. Dyer co chairs various NINA work groups and is an emergency number professional ENP. Uh, you guys can take it away. All right, I'm working on sharing the screen the right way. So hold on one second. making sure we can get this set up. Um, yeah, we had a little bit of a change. Sandy Dyer was unable to be on the call today. So my name is Mark Whitby and I'm filling in for Sandy. I am a subject matter expert as well and on some of the NINA work groups. And my co-presenter, Annie Cahill is on the call as well. And we're also supported by Drew Fiorinelli who's on there in case we need anything. So let's go ahead and get kickstarted. Thank you for being here today and happy Friday, the last day of your conference. Looks like it's been really good, a lot of donations, so thank you for that. Annie, if you wanna do a little introduction of yourself or just say hi, if nothing else. <laughs> hey, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Annie Cahill and I'm a technical manager with Datamark. Uh, I live here in Virginia and I worked and did address management uh, in local government for about 15 years. So um, I do sit on the board of directors for a couple of different uh, groups, uh, GITA and GISCI. And I'm really happy to be here this morning to talk to you guys about NG911. And like I said, my name is Mark Whitby. I spent 21 years in the PSAP, started as a call taker, worked my way up through director. And then the last 10 years of my career, I moved over to the support side, worked on MSAGs, alleys, um, wireless providers, wireline providers, and then moved into GIS. So Annie and I are gonna talk to you a little bit about today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the legacy 901 system, the way it is set up now, and then why are we moving to next gen? And then we're gonna talk about plans, workflows, and relationships, really important thing. So what to expect when you're expecting as we move from legacy to next gen? Well, we really don't know. Some of the standards are still coming out. Uh, providers are giving us some really good guidance on what we need to do and whatnot. So let's talk about some of these things that are gonna be happening, right? Um, so when we talk about legacy call flow and location data, most of our information is provided by the telephone company. Okay, the landline, the wireless, the VoIP, um, but we have something called an MSAG and an alley that we use in the selective router with the phone companies. And what happens is when someone calls 911, it goes through their central office, goes to a router, and a phone number is associated with an ESN. An ESN then says, okay, this ESN goes to this PSAP, this public safety answering point or 911 center. So it gets routed, and then the phone number goes back to the alley and gets an update or a rebid to give us the most accurate information. So we use this with landlines. Well, landlines are pretty good because your house address is associated with that phone number. So if it's entered correctly, it comes through the system. Well, then we added wireline, or I'm sorry, wireless. Well, that's rated on towers and sector orientation of those towers. So maybe it's not as accurate. So in the alley, the alley is that phone number that's associated to an address. And this is what the dispatcher sees on their screen, which gives us our information. And then the call taker verifies to make sure that information on the screen is correct. When I was working as a call taker, I relied on that data. 
Well, that isn't always correct because sometimes people move and the phone company hasn't updated their address yet. Or nowadays you can port numbers a lot easier than you could back in the early 80s and even in the early 90s. The MSAG system that we use is basically an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, it has different fields and it's kind of like our road center line currently, how it has an address range and a street name and a street type. And in, and in this case, and the MSAG is an ESN for the call rally. This is all tabular data. Our alley system and our MSAG systems are all tabular. They're not spatial. So they're not geographically correct because it could be different in the real world. So that phone number, so they call from this phone number of 401. It has an address. It goes, double checks the MSAG to make sure, hey, is this ESN right? Is this going to the proper PSAC? In next gen, it's gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna have something called an EZNet, Emergency Services Network, right? It's an IP-based network. It's not gonna be these analog lines or these camera trunks that we currently use. And we're gonna use that GIS data that you guys are working on, the road center lines, address points, the boundaries, things that we currently don't use in 911 because we just use MSAG and Alley. It's gonna go through that Next gen core services, it's gonna go through the ECRF, the LDF, it's gonna verify locations beforehand, and then it's gonna get routed properly to the correct PSAC. Because right now, a lot of calls are misrouted in 911. Not wireline as much, but wireless and VoIP can be misdirected. And the call handling equipment's gonna be able to be more user-friendly. It's gonna be able to provide us that location upfront instead of post call as we call it. After the operator already has it, the location's gonna come with the call. It's gonna be much more efficient, much more effective, and call takers are still gonna verify information because that's what we do. So here's a call flow. If you look at this and you go, oh my gosh, this is a lot, right? Well, the originating providers is gonna you know, provide us information. It's gonna go through a series of what they call border control functions or firewalls. And in our system, in the EZNet is gonna be our GIS data. It's not gonna be at, at the PSAP level, it's gonna be pre-verified in the EZNet. The 911 authority is the one responsible to put that information into the EZNet. So we're gonna be relying on our GIS providers at the local and county level, even the state level, to make sure that we have the most accurate data in our systems. And it's gonna do a lot of QA and QC checks ahead of time. So if we add a new subdivision or a new road, we can do these quality assurance checks at the beginning, making sure that data is correct. So if a 911 call comes in, uses that new road or new subdivision, it's gonna route properly. And then it's gonna to go to the PSAP. And the PSAP will have maps with their CAD systems, maybe with their phone systems but they'll be using local data, a lot more reliable than some of the other data sources we currently use. So there's a couple data layers that are gonna be required in next generation 911. Address points are one of them because they're very specific for that address. Uh, some places have address points, some places don't, but they're working on them and that's, that's a great thing to have. A uh, road center line, kind of like the M side, but GIS departments have road center lines with ranges and ESNs left and right and community names left and right. You're gonna have something called a public safety answering point or PSAP boundary. That is gonna be a boundary where any call that comes in inside that boundary is gonna be routed to this PSAP. So that's very important for us to have. It's kind of like ESNs, but the ESNs are in a tabular database right now. We're gonna have a layer that actually shows where this caller is, this is the PSAP that gets it. Because in a lot of areas, one PSAP may answer calls from multiple counties or multiple municipalities. Then you're gonna have the emergency service boundaries. So you have a law boundary, a fire boundary, an EMS boundary. Law boundaries are pretty legal where a police department has this jurisdiction, they can't go into the unincorporated county because you have to be deputized. Fire and EMS, their boundaries are a lot bigger because mutual aid agreements where you're responding based on closest unit response. 
And then the provisioning boundary is something new for a lot of us. Provisioning boundary is a boundary that encompasses all the GIS data that you as a county or municipality or state are responsible for. So any changes, they have to know who to notify to make a change if something's incorrect. So five, five layers that we're gonna have to have. So GIS takes a lot of time to build. And Drew, who's on the call as well, gives a good example of when he worked in uh, Virginia and it took them, they had pretty good data, but to get some of these things, it took about two years in their GIS shop that they were doing it themselves without a vendor. So the location validation function or LVF, it pre-validates this information. So we wanna make sure that this phone record will map to this address or this road center line. If there's an error, it goes back to the 911 authority and says, hey, there's a problem. Okay, well, maybe it's a new address or maybe it, we need a sub address for that address that we didn't have in the system. Anytime there's um, something that's non-unique, right? So maybe you have duplicate address points or the range overlaps on a road it's gonna come back and say, hey, you need to correct this. And in NextGen 911, there's a three-day turnaround, three business days. So we get notified of an error, we have three business days to research it, correct it, and load it back up into the cloud, into the ESINet. We're not used to that kind of time frame. We've never had that before, so that's something to get used to. The emergency call routing function, its main job as a layer, or not as a layer, I'm sorry, as a, as a system in the ESINet is to make sure the call gets to the right place. Currently, 911 calls get misrouted. If you hit a tower and maybe it picks a wrong sector, or you're in one county and the tower's in a different county, but you're in, in this county over here, maybe it gets routed to where the tower is and not the sector. But we're gonna use these validated locations, we're gonna use it a little differently than what the LVF does, but it's all the same data. So that's important. It's one data source. It's not multiple silos of data. So why, why are we going to NextGen? Well, our MSAG and Alley are outdated. We've been using them for a very long time. Uh, we've manipulated them and they're not as accurate as geospatial rate routing would be. So if we're using address points, road center line, boundaries, it's gonna make it a lot more accurate. We're gonna have either a valid address or if it's wireless or some other type of device like a MiFi device or something in a hotel, it's gonna provide a lot long, which is pretty accurate. So these are really important to be able to figure out why, why we do what we do and how we do what we do. So legacy systems are what we use now, 911 or enhanced 911. But next gen, completely different. There's a lot of transition to go into this. So there needs to be a lot of planning ahead of time. How are we gonna get there, right? What resources do we need? You can replace a CAD system, you can replace a phone system, you can replace a radio system with a vendor, okay? Not a lot of GIS data is in that, right? to make sure it's next-gen compliant or I3 compliant. But you have to look at your local business needs. What are your workflows? You know, how many addressing authorities are in your jurisdiction or in your county? Uh, what about the phone providers? You know, some of us use MSAG and Alley through companies like Com Comtech or Entrato. You know, what's the capability if we need to make a major changes as we start moving toward next-gen? And then how available is our GIS data? Do we need to get some from a third party? Do we need to work with our property appraiser, tax collector, maybe public works or utilities has data to make our data for next gen 911 even better, right? Makes a big difference. So now we're gonna talk about what to expect with plans and workflows and relationships. Oh my, there's a lot of things. So I'm gonna turn it over to Annie and she's gonna walk you through this. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so you just heard Mark talk about um, 
how the transition is really going to encompass GIS data. And I think that's probably the biggest thing uh -huh. that a lot of GIS professionals don't understand. Um, you know, you hear continually about next gen 911, uh, depending on the state that where you are. Um, but th the main thing is that GIS professionals are really becoming geospatial first responders because their data is being used to make critical decisions and the data is being used in a mission critical way. So it may take some thoughtful interpretation about how we manage and maintain our data going forward. Um, and that, that actually involves a closer look at a lot of the different things that we do as part of our normal uh, business workflows. Um, anyone who's been through an NG911 deployment can tell you that the heavy lift is not the hardware, software, call taking equipment. It's always going to be in preparing the GIS data, simply because um, a lot of our GIS data has very muddied past. Um, a lot of different people may have maintained it. Um, you might have uh, different uh, players involved, different, different people maintaining the data, and that creates its own set of issues. Okay, but these are some of the things that we like to look at as far as our GIS data. So we need to make sure that our um, road center lines and our NSAGs are answering the same question, okay, and reflecting the same information. information. We need to look at um, our boundary creation and updates because boundary data is actually what's gonna be used to route the call to the correct PSAP, right? So your GIS data is going to be used before the call ever comes into a PSAP. Um, we need to look at normalizing the data, which um, requires us to take a closer look at how we're maintaining the data. We also need to look at our alley and GIS comparison. What do we have for addresses? And then also ongoing uh, data maintenance this is very important. So uh, currently, when you think about public safety stakeholders, you're really thinking about who? EMS, 911, fire, and police. Those are typically who we think of when we think of public safety stakeholders, okay? But when we're talking about preparing data for NG911, we need to understand that NG911 really expands the list of stakeholders, okay? And what does this mean? Well, this means that you're not just going to be looking at public safety folks to help you get your data ready. You're gonna to have to bring in other departments because of the data that's involved. Um, a lot of times we see this with the addressing authority. Um, sometimes your addressing authority is not in public safety um, or your GIS is not, is not related to public safety. Your GIS may or may not be your addressing authority. Uh, maybe it's planning and zoning. And so then we have to ask the question, well, what are the implications when you have someone in planning and zoning who is assigning addresses for planning and zoning business needs? How is that different than uh, public safety business needs? Okay, also bringing in public works. Maybe public works is responsible for managing the road center line data. And you'd have to ask the same question. Are they gonna be concerned with the same information as public safety? Probably not, okay? Um, IT and GIS. Your stakeholders are gonna take many forms uh, depending on the structure of your organization. So it's very important to have an understanding of who all of these people are. Okay, so really the best way to, to talk about and to plan out this work is really to generate a strategic plan. And with Datamark, that's actually, um, that's actually my primary role as I, as I actually do strategic planning for our company, but we really have a process that kind of looks like this, okay? We go into an organization, we find out who the stakeholders are, and then we sit with them and we understand their workflows, okay? We ask them all of these different questions pertaining to their addressing life cycle, the road center lines. Um, if they have municipalities who are their own addressing authority, that's critical. You wouldn't believe the number of people I talk to who say, look, you know, we have four municipalities and they assign their own addresses and they don't communicate with us. We don't have any idea of how they're, how they're assigning their numbers, how often, and we're missing big chunks of data. So also think about that from a public safety perspective. What does it mean when you're not getting all of the data back into your master address point? 
okay? We also need to understand the public safety workflows and how the GIS data is provisioned into public safety systems and what the discrepancy process looks like if an, if, um, an anomaly is identified, okay? Um, and it really goes back to this idea of, you know, you have to, you have to get out of this mindset of, okay, it's, it's all based on my local 911. It's, it's, it's just my boundaries of 911. No, it's, it's ultimately designed to be a network of networks, right? So it's designed to be a nationwide system. So if my PSAP in Virginia fails, then one in Oklahoma or Wisconsin or Michigan can route calls. Okay, so, so we have to kind of get, expand outside of that thinking that we're just limited to our own area. Okay, and again, that does change the way that we manage our data. All right, so from the GIS side of things, we also assess the data quality and how the data is used within the organization. Okay, so as far as um, information gathering, this is just an example of um, the type of information that we're looking for when we ask someone about their addressing workflow. Understanding who assigns the address is not enough. It's just not enough, okay? You have to understand the entire process from how the request originates all the way through the assignment process, how the number is assigned, um, the numbering system, the ordinances, all of that, um, how it's entered into GIS, uh, and then finally, how it's provisioned into public safety, and then the discrepancy process. So you really can't have too much information when you're assessing these different workflows, okay? And this is really important because obviously the address assignment process can span multiple departments. So if you're having issues obtaining information, this is a really good way to identify any potential choke points along the way. Sure. And Mark, I think you were going to speak on MSAG and GIS. Yeah, MSAG's kind of my jam, right? Because I spent a lot of time working with MSAGs and alleys. And now we're going to be doing comparisons, okay? Uh, Nina has a document that talks about synchronizing your GIS data to your MSAG and your alley. Well, you want to compare these because currently our MSAG is how we route calls, right? with that address range, a low range, a high range, street name, street types, community names. Well, in the future, it's gonna be our road center line that's gonna do this. So we want our road center line to answer the questions our MSAG currently does. Well, one of the things you need to think about is, do you trust your MSAG data? How accurate is your MSAG? Like I said, we've manipulated it over the years to make it do what it can do for us because we added wireless and we added VoIP and we've added sector tower, sector orientation. And maybe we call roads differently sometimes because that's how our CAD system needs it. So what you're gonna do is you're going to look at, okay, my road center line's really good. So let's compare these two. You're gonna take some things out of the MSAG that are not valid, but do you have all the road center line information that's in your MSAG? Are the ranges the same? Sometimes in, in our MSAG, we'll use a theoretical range. So maybe from you know, 100 to 1,000. But on our road center lines, we have them in segments, right? So it may not match up. Maybe you go back and alter your MSAG or you make adjustments to your road center line. But comparing those two is usually a really good first step because you need to normalize that data, right? You need to make sure you're comparing avenue to avenue. It's spelled the same or it's abbreviated the same, makes a big difference. So when you're comparing these, you have your tabular data at the top, right? So in this case, you know we're looking at East Denver Avenue. So in the MSAG, we have a range of 2,700 to 2,798. Um, we have the community, and then on the road center line, we have 2,700 to 2,798, and 2,701, to 2799, well, there is no 2799 in our MSAG, right? So maybe we need to bump our MSAG up one address so it matches, right? And then we're gonna look at the ESN. Is the ESN in the MSAG the same as the road center line? What if it's different? 
Well, maybe the call is being routed to a wrong place for this one street range. So we need to compare that. All right, Annie, I'll let you talk about boundaries. Thank you. Everyone's favorite topic. So <laughs> boundaries um, are really what are going to be used to route the call. Okay, we, we've already talked about that extensively. But the primary thing to understand is that, you know, we're going to be creating boundaries that are new to a lot of us, right? So we're going to have a PSAT boundary. And for most of us, most of us, this is going to be a duplication of um, our local boundary, our county boundary. But the important thing to remember is that there are two different boundaries with two different purposes. Okay, your local boundary is your uh, legislative jurisdictional boundary. Um, your PSAT boundary is strictly for call routing. So you can adjust that as necessary. Okay, a lot of people get hung up when we talk about boundaries. They're worried about, well, we can't change our boundaries. You absolutely can. Okay. Um, also, many of us may be maintaining um, ESZs or ESN boundaries, or you may call them response zones or fireboxes, whatever you call them. But in NextGen 911, you're going to need an individual service boundary for fire, law, and EMS. Okay, and those are going to be new for most of us. Now, the important thing to understand is that anytime, GIS folks, that you're creating boundaries, um, you need to engage your PSAP staff. Look, I'm a GIS person, and I'll draw anything you want anywhere you want it. Okay, that's, that's what we do, right? Just tell me where to draw the line. But we can't do this with our emergency boundaries. Okay, these are not GIS decisions. These are definitely authoritative PSAP decisions and you have to engage that staff. Yeah, we can run a dissolve on our ESN based on the service type to get a first pass boundary, um, but you definitely want to bring in your PSAP uh, to get a clear picture of, hey, is this boundary correct? Does this reflect where the call would go first? That's the question you need to ask. Okay, and then especially when you're talking about your neighbors, you definitely want to engage your neighbors when you're drawing these boundaries as well. Okay, because it's very important to have uh, that understanding and MOUs and all of that stuff if there's um, anything that needs to be documented there. We always want to memorialize any decisions that we're making about our boundaries. And so we know that there are many different boundaries that are that can be used in NG911. Okay, so you, you can bring in your counties and your municipalities and, and all of those types of things. But at the end of the day, the ones that are going to be used to route the call are going to be your PSAP boundary and then your law fire and EMS. Now, one thing that's not on here that we haven't discussed is your provisioning boundary. And your provisioning boundary is really your geofence that, that tells the spatial interface, hey, this is the area that I'm responsible for maintaining data. So that's your provisioning boundary. Um, it's called different things depending on, on the state, but generally in the national standards, it's referred to as your provisioning boundary. Okay. So for next gen call routing to work, um, when we bring all of the boundaries together, the important thing is we need to ensure that we don't have any gaps or overlaps between the boundaries. Okay, because what will happen is, is it'll go to default routing, which is what we don't want. Okay, we don't want a 911 call to be placed and not have the right boundary to support the call, uh, causing it to default route. All right, so it's very important to assess the topology of your data. Make sure um, that, that your boundaries are topologically accurate, okay, and that your, your boundaries are actually reflecting um, what, would, what would occur in the real world uh, for call routing. Okay, so as far as data normalization, this is really taking a look at, um, at the quality assurance of the data as far as like the way that we're maintaining it. So one example, um, and we can just go ahead and skip to the next slide because this is a better example of normalization. So a lot of us right now are maintaining probably following based on publication 28 from the US Postal Service um, with abbreviated values, okay? But going forward in NextGen 911, you're gonna need to spell out these values. 
So parsing the data into individual fields, if you have a full address that's concatenated into one field and that's currently the only way that you're managing your data, you're going to need to parse that out into individual fields. Okay, and the standard really um, details that for you. Okay, and then of course, if you need help, we can we can also help you with that as well um, if you have questions about that. But yes, you definitely need to normalize your values. You need to spell out now, but, but at the same time here, I also want you to be very mindful of the current systems that your GIS data supports, okay? You don't wanna just go in and start willy-nilly making changes to your schema, okay? You have to give this some thought, all right? And this is where the planning comes in. So one of the things that you might want to do as part of your information gathering is really document what other systems that your GIS data is supporting. Maybe you have an asset management system, maybe you have like a, an enterprise permitting system or something and you know you need your data to be structured a specific way. This is the way that you're going to do this, okay? You're going to you're going to get a schema um, and so you have an understanding of, of what the data is supposed to look like that's supporting these other systems because you don't want to change things around so much to where you're breaking everything else. <laughs> so just be mindful of that. Um, we do have people that that's happened to when they, you know, when they, when they go off on their own and they want to do this and that's fine. Um, it's definitely a good, a good way to learn, right? Um, but not the ideal way. So um, just be mindful of, of the systems that you're currently supporting with your GIS data and consider moving um, some data to those legacy fields within the data model. Yeah, and this is a good example of for like CAD systems, for the 901 CAD system, a lot of CADs use two letter abbreviations for street types. So your CAD may use AV, your MSAG and ALI are using AVE, and maybe your road center line and your address points have it spelled out, right? So if you compare the three of those, it's gonna fall out all over the place. But like Annie said, you can't go in and just say, okay, from now on, everything's Avenue. Well, now the CAD won't work and now the MSAG doesn't work, right? So really good example, thank you. Okay, so taking a look at data consistency, um, one of the ways that we look at this is we examine what are called fish bones, right? And fish bones really uh, relate to the geocoding of the actual structure along the intended placement on the road center line. All right, so ideally we wanna see fish bones that are uh, perpendicular to the structure on the road center line because this tells us that the geocoding is gonna take um, a vehicle to the front of the structure. Okay, so on the right-hand side, you can see um, how steep those fish bones are. Might need to do some range adjustments in there to, to straighten out those fish bones. Um, but when your data lacks consistency, you can definitely have issues with your call routing there, okay, especially where you have a boundary um, and then you have some, some inconsistent data within the boundary uh, that changes. That's pretty bad as well. So just want to be mindful of that. So okay. you got this? Yep. Oh, yeah. So for data quality, we're looking at several different things, right? We wanna make sure the data is available, okay? Do we have everything? Um, you know, if, if it's a stakeholder that's maintaining the address points, can we get to it? Um, so availability is extremely important. Uh, completeness. Completeness really has different layers, I would say. So completeness would be, okay, do I have all of the required layers for NG911? Um, do I have all of the attributes that are called for within, within the model? Okay, are all my attributes present? And then finally, the other layer of completeness is, is simply, is all my data represented? <laughs> um, do, am I showing everything that's in the real world, right? So am I showing all of the address points? Am I missing some? And what can I do to correct that? All right, accuracy. We wanna make sure that the data reflects what's in the real world, okay? Do you have all of your road center lines represented? Do you have a routable data set? I mean, this is this is all very important. Um, timeliness. We want we want our data to be timely. Okay. Um, again, you are becoming geospatial first responders. You don't want to use old, outdated GIS data within your systems. Okay. So make sure the data is timely, um, and then also again ensure that consistency between systems.
All right, so we kind of talked about the MSAG comparing to your GIS, and we talked about that NINA standard. Well, now, as part of the process, you want to compare your alley to your GIS. So the alley is basically a phone number associated with an address. So if you think of it, you're, you're comparing it to your address points, right? And making sure that range on that road center line encompasses that address for that house. So again, in your, in your alley, you're gonna have phone records, you're gonna have addresses, you're gonna have your road center line. So in this case, 126 North Main. So we wanna know where that is, 127 North Main, 128 North Main. So we're making sure, okay, those addresses fall on the range of the road center line. There's an associated address point. And that ESN matches, right? Because again, that's how we're gonna be routing the calls in next gen, not based on the ESN number, but those PSAP boundaries, right? Who's responsible? and that law, fire, and EMS, which responders are going for that PSAP to that location. So again, you're doing that tabular uh, comparison to spatial. So again, 123 Main Street, yep, we have an address. 124, yep, we got one. All the way through the system, because what if you have something in your alley, but there's no address point for it? Well, is it valid? First of all, you know, maybe it's an old record in our alley that the phone company never took out when they moved, right? So we may have to do some research to see, is it accurate? Is it really going to fit? And does it fit in that right boundary like Annie was talking about? Because the boundary is going to route the call. Well, if you notice that second one, 124 Main Street, it's right there on that bubble, right? So maybe we have to draw, make that boundary fit that address. Same thing with 125, it kind of cuts off some of the property and it definitely cuts off some of 127. So those are things you'll have to look at. Yeah, and I just noticed in the chat that Nancy had mentioned um, setting up an ETL. And Nancy, that, that's, that is ideal, okay? I mean, we, we talk to people all over the nation who manage their data for 911 differently. Um, some people, want to just adopt the 911 schema. That's that's just what they want to do and they want to move their existing addressing into those legacy fields so they can continue um, supporting their CAD system and all these other types of, of data um, or applications rather. The the thing is is that some people don't don't have the resources to develop an ETL process or you know they may just be a PSAP person who is kind of stuck with managing the GIS for, for lack of a better term. But we, we talk to a lot of people like that who wear many hats. They're not really a trained GIS professional. So really, um, it's going to depend on the resources, how you do this. Um, you know, you can definitely develop an ETL process if you know what you're doing in GIS. But for people who, who don't, um, you know, they choose to do it different ways. Um, some, some have us do it or another type of vendor. Um, some people will, for lack of a better term, they'll Frankenstein the schemas together. We have several people who do that. They just say, okay, well, you know, I, they go down the list, right? So I have this field, this field, and this field, and I'm just going to add all of these fields on, um, onto my address point so I can make this compliant, right? Because they might maintain, you know, property identification number associated with every address point but they want to keep that data and then just add the ones that are required for 911. So there's lots of different ways of doing this. So I do appreciate the comment. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't address that before, but it's really going to be resource dependent. Um, and of course, if you have that knowledge to, to do that. So um, talking about data maintenance, we do need to ensure that we have, we want to have a, a quality assurance culture, right? We want to have that developed within our organization. And depending on your locality, you may edit your data frequently, right? You may be putting in big subdivisions with address points or roads, um, lots of construction. Um, but the data really needs and really benefits from routine validations. Um, and, and you can set this up at whatever interval you feel is appropriate for your locality based on your level of data editing. Okay, but you want to have some type of schedule set up to validate the data 
and to ensure that you know you don't have any anomalies and that you're marking exceptions in your data where appropriate. Okay, so as far as data maintenance, um, it really involves a lot. Remember we talked about how the data needs to be available, it needs to be complete and accurate and all that good stuff, okay? But this really starts with that information gathering, okay? It, it starts by understanding who your stakeholders are. I know a particular challenge for me when I was managing um, the addresses here in Virginia is that um, in the city where I worked, planning and zoning was the addressing authority, but they did not really have any concept of addressing for public safety. They were addressing for planning and zoning needs, which, which in and of itself is, is a whole can of worms. Okay, so we need to understand who's maintaining it and how, how it's being used. Okay, because that might open up a bigger conversation in your locality, right? Does planning and zoning really need to be the addressing authority or should it be moved elsewhere? Okay, because again, addressing is for public safety. That's the primary purpose of addressing. Okay, we need to make sure that for 911, we're establishing authoritative data sets and overseeing that data creation and establishing that um, quality assurance culture, right? Continual validation, bringing in our stakeholders as necessary, and then ensuring that um, if there are any anomalies or discrepancies identified in the data, that we have some type of feedback loop. And one of the things that we frequently recommend to people is um, a ticketing system, okay? Because according to national standards, if the spatial interface identifies um, any type of anomaly, you have to correct it within three business days. Now, our understanding of what that means is, is really evolving, but it kind of gives you an idea of the urgency of, of how you maintain your GIS data. You can't really let sleeping dogs lie anymore, right? You have to correct things as they come up. Okay. Okay, so next steps in your process. Um, really, it, it's gonna depend on, on what you identify as your main needs and where your gaps are. I always tell people to, you know, seek the low hanging fruit, right? The things that you can easily correct um, right now with the resources you have. But these are just some of the areas where we, um, we see either a need or people identify it as a need or we identify it as a need for them. Okay, so improved communication among stakeholders. Okay, a lot of people don't understand the conversation around NG911. Um, collaboration and process improvement. Uh, for the GIS, we've, we've really talked about that extensively here today, right? But again, understanding um, who maintains it. Um, and then of course, building out the data to meet the national standards for the schema and for the required layers and ongoing maintenance. Um, the documentation, um, SOPs, think about succession planning. If you win the lottery tomorrow, who, who's gonna come in and take your place and continue those workflows? Right, you have to think about these things. Um, the same with training. Um, you want to make sure that everyone understands what their duties are. Okay, again, this is mission critical data that we're talking about here. All right, so maybe you need additional training. Um, maybe the person who has been kind of put in charge of GIS, but that's not their that's not their area of study. Maybe they're like a PSAT person or a, a firefighter or something. You know, you want to make sure that these people have the tools that they need to be successful. So that might involve allocating some resources to training. Okay, and then frequently we talk to people who say staffing is a concern. We want to do this on our own, but we don't have the resources currently. We definitely have the technology, but we don't have the resources. And what does that look like for staffing? Do you need a GIS tech? Do you need a whole new GIS department? Does public safety need their own dedicated GIS person? Um, we're talking to a lot of localities now across the nation that are going through major CAD upgrades. And a popular thing that we're seeing is that they're actually hiring for um, someone to manage the CAD and public safety systems, as well as maintain the GIS data to feed those systems. So those are just some, some ideas for your next steps. All right, so a call to action. 
we need to start thinking if we haven't already or haven't started working toward next gen, we need to think about things like governance. You know, who's gonna be responsible? Who are those stakeholders like Annie talked about? Do we need MOUs? Do we need to maybe move addressing under public safety and move GIS under public safety or have a GIS person specifically for public safety, right? We need to look at roles and relationships. You know, do you know who your 911 authority is? You know, maybe you should start building that relationship if you haven't already. And that 911 authority is going to be responsible for sending that all that GIS data to these next gen systems up in the cloud. You know, who's your GIS data provider? Is it, you know, is it local? Is it at the county level? Do you have a vendor that you're using? And if you start going from a local to a regional type process, who's going to be responsible to aggregate that data? and maybe send it up to the state as the state implements NextGen 911. You know, maybe you have a local data provider that can help you or different data sets that you can get. Like Annie talked about really well, processes and workflows. You know, as we move to NextGen, we're gonna have that three-day turnaround. How do we build that into our workflow now so we're comfortable with it when we get to NextGen? What kind of agreements do we need to have? You know, especially with public safety. You know, maybe we need to meet periodically with the fire chiefs and the EMS chiefs and the sheriffs and the police chiefs to, if in case any boundaries change, right? Annexations occur. And we need to work with our GIS teams. Maybe they need more staffing like, like Andy talked about. Maybe we need to hire somebody just for public safety and GIS. And then the biggest one is funding. You know, people need to look at, okay, what do we need to do how are we gonna get there? Do we need more resources like staffing? Do we need to upgrade our ArcGIS Esri system? Or you know, maybe we need to uh, get software from a vendor that can help us validate software, or you know, maybe we can edit or mark exceptions to things that happen in our jurisdiction. There, are, there is federal funding out there for a lot of states that got federal funding last year, um, but that timeframe is gonna end in March of 2022 so your project has to be done. Well, we don't know if the federal government's gonna extend that or they're gonna give another round of funding for some of these next gen projects. You know, it's expensive to maintain an E911 system currently. It's gonna be more expensive to, to be able to fund and manage a next gen system because there's a lot more components. But most places are gonna be running E911 and a next gen system at the same time because 911 centers, they can't go down. We can't just say, oh, you know, hey, we cut a phone line, we're done. We're, we're gone for the day. We'll come back tomorrow morning and start again. We still have to be there to answer those 911 calls, send law enforcement, send fire and send EMS. So start thinking about some of these things. And, and you know, Annie did really well about kind of talking about that strategic plan. So maybe now's a good time if you don't have something to start, or if you do have something, maybe fine tune it with some of the knowledge you're getting this week with this amazing WLIA conference. Yeah, and um, Mark, Fred says in the chat, um, he says, you make a good point, but 911 has a role to reach out to departments to share their needs and how departments are part of a larger system. This is absolutely the case. Um, we talk to so many people who, even within a locality, they don't communicate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing how, you know, how so many localities are different across the nation. You know, some communicate very well, some don't talk to each other at all. For example, when I did address management, um, I was responsible for the E911 addressing for the county in which I lived. And I never once went over to the PSAP to see how that data was being used in, in the PSAP. It's, it was just very, I always questioned it. And, you know, for whatever reason, it just never, <laughs> it was never, I was never told, hey, this is what you should go and do. Um, and so I never questioned it. But, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting, the dynamics within, within a locality and how people communicate and collaborate or how they don't for that matter. Yeah, and that's something we talked about yesterday when uh, Drew and I did a presentation for the conference. And that's one of the things we talked about was for GIS to go over and spend time in the 911 center. Now I know with COVID, it's gonna be a challenge, 
But even if you make a phone call to the 911 director or 911 manager or 911 authority and say, hey, how do you guys use the data that we provide to you? You know, is there, are there layers that you would like to see that maybe you, we just never sent to you because we didn't know you needed it? And then maybe 911 needs to come over and sit with the GIS team and say, hey, if we give you a new subdivision, right? Or a new road name or a, a range needs extended, show me the process. and. You know, why does it take so long or why, how do you get it done so fast, right? It could be the other way around, right? So very good point, Fred. It goes both ways. And 911 has always worked in the silo. You know, our MSAG was very secure. Our alley is very secure. Our comm center is very secure. You can't just walk in, right? You got to have key card access or you punch a code in or you have to have somebody come escort you in because there's a lot of sensitive information, but that's changing. You know, we need these stakeholders that have the expertise like GIS and IT that 911 traditionally doesn't have. So very good point. So any other questions that you guys have? We have a few moments. Yeah, we do. Thank you so much, guys. Um, great presentation. Uh, Annie was keeping track of all the uh, comments, so she got all the questions. Instead Annie's of awesome having like two that. presenters. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, thank you for your time today. Thanks for being on here with me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for filling in. Anytime. Thanks, Drew, for being here. If we needed you for support, we appreciate you. And hope you guys have a rest of your conference. It's really great. I know it's coming to a close, but you guys are doing really good things. It's hard to believe it's 34th annual conference. So that's great. Hey, this is Fred. I have uh, one quick question for both of you, I guess if we have a few minutes. We do. We're, we, we just kind of talked about in the chat and everything about integrated systems. Where, do you have examples of who is doing it right? Well, some, some are at a county level. Um, you know, we have some clients in Florida and some clients in Maryland that have started this process. And like Annie said, she's very involved with the strategic planning. So we've talked to some places that don't have the resources. We're talking to one client in Florida that she's a one person shop. She does, she's the 911 authority. She's also the GIS person. She's also you know, the GIS or GIS manager per se. And she just doesn't have the time or the knowledge to be able to do some things. Uh, there's other places that are very far advanced. They've had these conversations for a long time. And I know in the county I worked at in Pinellas, we created an addressing authority group and I represented the 911 side, but I brought all these people in and we already had a really good relationship with police and fire and EMS, but we didn't really have a good relationship with the people that assign addresses or the GIS side. So we brought the GIS side in and we just started having these meetings and we started talking about NINA standards and, hey, we need to be more consistent how we do this. We need to do our own quality assurance. So an addressing authority would assign an address and before they gave it out to the public, they would send it to me and I would be their you know, extra set of eyes. Annie, do you have some examples? Oh, geez. I mean, we, you know, it's interesting because the strategic plan process is, is one that involves a lot of um, you know short-term goals as well as long-term and you know a lot of things haven't been realized yet because of the long-term planning like staffing but the recommendations that we make as far as the data is is usually executed on immediately because again if they have the resources to manage the data then they can go ahead and get that corrected um, Communication is a big one. I think that the most successful deployments will always have good communication, um, especially when we start talking about um, reaching completeness with your address points. That's really big deal. Um, we always recommend for a locality that has uh, different communities that are their own addressing authorities to go ahead and form a group where they can meet and discuss different things. Um, so we've, we've definitely seen success um, in a lot, basically in all of our clients. It's just that the long-term hasn't been realized yet just because of the, the nature of that. Like for example, one county in Florida, they have a homegrown CAD system 
like they actually built it internally and they, they have staff on hand to update it internally as far as the code and things. However, that CAD system has not received GIS data in over 10 years. And so that's a really big and really sensitive conversation because of the political nature of it. Um, you know, when you're stuck on a CAD system and we, the vendor comes in and recommends, hey, you know, you should probably have, a, have an assessment done to see if this is really what you want for NG91, because it's definitely not NG91 ready. You know, as you can imagine, that's a bigger conversation. So yes, we have seen success in all of our clients, just varying degrees based on what's been recommended in the plan. Sorry, I can be long-winded. <laughs> no, that, that, that's helpful. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that we will be continuing to have these conversations. Wisconsin's early in the, in the effort to, to adopt an NG911 system statewide. Um, but I think that that ultimately, you know, down the line thinking in the future would be great to have some examples of who is doing it right at the local or even at the state level and, and understanding there are kinks and things you have to work through. Yep, and every, every, every county is a little bit different. You know, you may have one county that's the primary piece app and they answer all 911 calls. And then you go to the county to the right of that and they have seven different piece apps. So they're gonna have different piece app layers. So they're gonna have a lot more work to be done than the one that has their county boundary is actually almost like their PSAT boundary. So a lot of different things. And of course, like Annie was saying, long-term, you know, Nina's always, always updating their documentation that, you know, they finish, a, they finish a, a standard or a recommendation or an information document. And then a year later, they're like, hey, some things have changed. You know, vendors have different technologies or, hey, we forgot this. We need this field for whatever reason. So they're always changing and updating and making those documents better. And then we have to go back and look at our workflows or maybe look at, uh, oh, we, we're gonna need more staff for this because now it's a requirement for Nina. And Nina is a really good place to get your resources. The Nina website is great and you do not have to be a Nina member to download the documents. So that's a great place to start as well and have some of these conversations. Great. Thank you so much, Annie and Mark.